in this room and everyone we know that's 18 and over are all faced with decisions that hopefully will require a lot of thoughtful and comprehensive facts that highlight all the angles and all the implications of those ultimate decisions that we will make when we enter into the polls. So that leads us to the purpose of today. Rotary has always been an organization that is willing to tackle the issues that other folks sometimes didn't want to look at. It's why this city didn't become, as you will hear from Andrea Young, Birmingham. It didn't shy away from the issues around race and what that meant for our future. And that was guided in large part by Ivan Allen, who was a founding member of this club as well. So today, we will hear from three experts in their fields who will offer balanced opinion and fact about the implications of laws that may be made in the future or that maybe are already on the books. And one of the things that is important to me, um, I like to be in the mind frame of always learning. I think that rethinking um, my opinion based on new facts is not in fact something to dismiss, but it's something to celebrate because it's a sign of growth. And I follow a man named Adam Grant. Many of you have probably heard of Alan, uh, Adam Grant, who has one of my favorite books out that's called Think Again. And one of the things that Adam says is the voice that challenges your opinion often sharpens your thinking. So today's goal is to sharpen your thinking by presenting the facts around these important decisions so that as you formulate your own opinions and go in to make these decisions, you do so armed with some of the best information that we as a club could make available to you. So with that, I will turn it over to Ken Hodges, you just heard him introduced, to introduce this very wonderful panel that has been gathered for you today. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, President Stephanie. Um, with uh, three very distinguished panelists, uh, I've decided the only way to introduce them is alphabetical and abbreviated, because we could spend the entire 30 minutes talking about the accomplishments of these three people. Uh, we have first uh, Chuck Efstration on the far left. Uh, Chuck, as you can see, uh, currently serves in the House of Representatives, District 104. That's in Gwinnett. He's been there for 10 years, and he is currently the chair of the Judiciary Committee, where I worked with him on a number of issues uh, with the state bar. And I will tell you, the number of lawyer legislators has declined. Uh, I think it's good that Georgia has a diverse legislature, people coming from all different uh, walks of life. But I find that lawyer legislators are, are, are wonderful when we're passing laws that impact people. Um, and uh, thank you for your service on that. I know it detracts from your law firm and your law practice, where he's currently in Gwinnett at the Efstration Law Firm, and he's a former assistant district attorney. We have the Honorable Dave Namius, uh, former Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, he was working uh, in the building with me for a little while before he recently retired, and he's now going to take his expertise to Emory University, where he's going to be teaching constitutional state law. Um, he's a former federal prosecutor, was the U.S. Attorney here in the Northern District, as well as a line AUSA for a number of years, and a senior Justice Department official. Um, and he formerly clerked for the D.C. Uh, Circuit Court Lawrence Silberman and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. And finally, we have Andrea Young, uh, the Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union here in Georgia. She's a former um, adjunct professor at the Andrew Young uh, Law of Policy and Studies here at Georgia State across the street, uh, a board member of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and the Dean's Council uh, of the Georgia State Andrew Young uh, School of Policy Studies, formerly the executive director of the Andrew Young Foundation and worked for Senator Edward Kennedy and Cynthia McKinney and co-authored a book with her father, uh, The Making of Modern Atlanta. So welcome to the three of you and we are going to get right to it. What are the voters thinking about here today? Um, it's the economy, stupid, quoting James Carville back in the uh, Bill Clinton days. Uh, these are the things that the uh, AJC poll indicates that 
are the top issues on voters' mind. Cost of living and the jobs and the economy are number one, um, and the dark blue is the number one priority, and the, the light blue is the secondary issue. So uh, these are things that are shaping the mind. So let's talk about some of the things that have recently happened and get some input from the panelists. Uh, in 2021, we had the Election Integrity Act, which required voters to provide IDs. Uh, there was a shorter window for absentee ballots. Drop boxes were reduced, and the period between the general election runoffs has changed from nine to four weeks. Um, and as a result of that, there were plenty that warned that there would be voter suppression as a result. Uh, the NLB All-Star Game was moved from Atlanta to Colorado, yet um, we have... Uh, record voter turnout already and I was listening to a podcast this morning on the way up from Albany talking about how it's not quite as of a presidential election year but we are knocking the uh, the, the ball out of the park uh, to keep the metaphors going uh, with early voter turnout. Um, so the question to the panelists and I'll just toss it out whoever wants to chime in first is do you think the Georgia's current voting rights law strikes an appropriate balance or is there more work to be done? Well, since um, the ACLU is in litigation against this law, uh, I'll start with that. I think that the heroic efforts that people are undertaking to you know, overcome uh, the restrictions uh, is not evidence that the bill is not a problem. Um, and you know, to remember that in 2020, five million people in Georgia cast a ballot under the existing rules then. Um, the, the, uh, the vote was, uh, there was a, a recount, a hand recount. There were, there were two machine recounts. There was an audit uh, of, uh, by the GBI of absentee ballots in Cobb County uh, and found to be that the result you know, was accurate. So you know, the, 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 the changes that have been made have made it more difficult. I was just meeting with a, a, a friend who lives in uh, Lake Lanier, who had come down to, uh, he has two residences, he had come down to his Buckhead residence to get his ballot. It hadn't arrived yet because there are all these restrictions about when counties can send out the ballots. We've seen a great decrease in the use of absentee ballots as a result of the law, which makes it a lot more difficult for people who travel for a living, as many people do in, in Metro Atlanta, people who are sick and shut in. I uh, have found it much more challenging to cast absentee ballots, and we do see a big decrease in the use of, uh, of mail-in ballots, which had become wonderfully, uh, uh, made it wonderfully accessible uh, for people uh, in the 2020 election, where again, five million people cast ballots. So we're, we're on track. Uh, I mean, the turnout uh, is incredible, uh, you know, and that is how democracy is supposed to work. But I don't see that as evidence that people are not having to overcome additional bar barriers in order to participate in the democratic process. Well, I want to first of all thank everyone for the invitation day. It's just an honor for me to be up here with this distinguished panel today. I also want to thank Rotary. I've worked on anti-human trafficking legislation at the Capitol over the years since I've been in the legislature. Rotary has been such a stalwart in support. Also, when I carried the anti-hate crimes bill in uh, 2019, 2020, Rotary was vocally in support, and that just means a lot. I, um, you know, from my observation, certainly I think that <clears throat> the... Uh, Senate Bill 202 that was passed has certainly made it easier to vote and harder to cheat, and we just see that with the numbers. You can look right now, uh, the turnout numbers so far in the general election this year are equal to what they are in a presidential cycle, and, and just with increased turnout every four years for presidential races, that's really an outlier. I think it very much supports uh, the fact that uh, we... We're coming out of, of course, COVID-19 pandemic. There were many provisions that had been approved by the state elections board that were not in law. And that's because we were in an emergency pandemic, very difficult time, of course, we all, we all remember. And, uh, and the benefit of Senate Bill 202 is we could codify and make consistent across the state many of those provisions. And finally, I would say this. Now, I know the topic today is um, elections versus the election uh, and the law, fact versus fiction. The, um, there, there was litigation filed prior to the 2018 election, Fair Fight versus Raffensperger, and Judge Jones in the Northern District of Georgia has just dismissed that suit here recently. So many times there are talking points around these, is these issues 
that we hear, hear about in campaign season, but ultimately when it's litigated in court, you can find what I believe the evidence very clearly shows. Georgia, it's easy to vote and it's hard to cheat. We have excellent election law in place. So I'll also thank you for inviting me to be here today and I'm gonna put a caveat that what I say today is my own views and is no reflection on how my former colleagues may decide any case about any of these issues. Um, I think in this area, like some others we may discuss, it's important to distinguish between uh, what is constitutional and what's good policy. Um, there have been a lot of attacks on some of these laws as being unconstitutional, but the reality is many of these um, things that people fight about you know, were not even things until just a few years ago. Early voting was not an American tradition. It's kind of developed over time, and Georgia's early voting laws, even under this law, are much more liberal than the, the early voting laws of states you would think are more liberal, like New Jersey or New York um, or Delaware. And, and also drop boxes. You know, drop boxes were almost unheard of until COVID. And then there were a lot of drop boxes. Lots of people like drop boxes. But um, it's kind of an unusual idea to say that something you implemented during COVID that had never been heard of before, if you cut back on them, you know, that is, that is a horrible constitutional violation. Separate that from policy. I mean, the real issues in this area is how hard do you want to make it for people to be able to register to vote and to be able to vote, and how much do you want to protect ballot integrity and make sure that there's no fraud? And I think those are the issues that people can have disagreements on, but um, somewhat along the lines of what Chairman Administration said, you know, it concerns me sometimes when people say, you know, it, it is Jim Crow to get rid of drop boxes. Um, I think that is an ignorance about what Jim Crow voting restrictions were, um, which were terrible and were in this state in the lifetime of many of us. Um, but it's also just, a, you need to think about where do you want our voting laws to be? Um, and, and the constitutional part of it is really kind of a secondary issue. It's really the people you vote for, um, and then they pass the laws, and you either think those are good or bad policy. Shifting to the current labor uh, market here, in 2011, the General Assembly passed HB 87, which cracked down on illegal immigration. And as a result, many farmers saw an agricultural labor shortage. Since 2022, uh, Georgia has seen record low employment rates, and we still have a labor shortage, not only in agriculture, but every time I go out to eat, or to uh, talk to a friend of mine that owns a restaurant, they talk about all the, the difficulty it is in having laborers come in and serve tables. What factors do you believe are contributing to the labor shortage problems, and do you have any suggestions as to how further legislation can alleviate it, or is there a concern that future legislation can lead to further unintent unintended consequences? And we'll start with representative administration. Well, thank you for the question. I won't pretend to know the ins and outs of national labor policy and what's involved there. I will say this, here in the state of Georgia, we're seeing a real impact due to inflation. The cost of living, um, cost uh, for housing, cost for groceries, for uh, gasoline, issues like that are uh, incredibly difficult right now for folks. And then you add on to that labor shortage and a need to increase prices as it results to that. I think that really the discussion that's around this issue, and you saw the slide earlier, 36% if you add cost of living and the economy together, 36% of voters, according to the AJC poll, say that the economy and cost of living are their top issue in this election. And so really it's these issues and the labor shortage absolutely plays into that. But a question as to the current national policy and what we're gonna do in the state of Georgia to respond to that is I think the real discussion and debate that we're having right now, or maybe it's the debate we should be having. And, um, and ultimately, addressing those issues with suspension of the gas tax, with uh, restoring funds to, uh, refunding funds to uh, Georgian taxpayers, and taking other proactive policy to work to address that, keeping the state open uh, where possible during the pandemic. These have all been very helpful things to allow Georgia to avoid the economic pitfalls that some other states find themselves in now. And, and uh, look no further than the state rainy day fund, currently at $6 billion and uh, at capacity. We're in a strong fiscal position, even if we are truly headed, headed into a recession. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're, we're seeing the impact of uh, immigration, the, the failure to enact 
progressive uh, immigration law at the, at the national level. I think it's difficult for Georgia to really act um, in the absence of new uh, standards. You know, one great example, of course, in Georgia, you know, would be how we uh, make permanent the uh, DREAM Act. So folks who have grown up with our kids here in Georgia, gone to our schools, uh, been, you know, contributing uh, members of this community were brought here for no reason of their own, but yet cannot have their status as Americans, you know, finally resolved. So that would be certainly one important place to start where there are a lot of talented people in our community, educated in our schools, that can't be full members of this community. This one's pretty much out of my bailiwick, so... Um not much to say other than, you know, on immigration issues, it would be nice if people could at least talk and try to figure out some solutions that may not be the absolute that they want. Um, when I was a U.S. attorney, you know, we would, we constantly had people calling for us to enforce the immigration laws against employers. When we enforce the immigration laws against employers, we immediately got calls from elected officials on behalf of their constituents whose workforces were now being deported, um, and so, you know, there have been efforts to address this issue, but the, it seems to be that because neither side can get 100% of what they want, we get 0% of anything. I don't know how much of that plays into, I think there are a lot of economic factors that play into this a lot more than just immigration laws. Um, and on your original question, I would say pretty much everything government does, including courts, has unexpected consequences. Um, well, let's get to your bailiwick and go to medical marijuana. Um, That's right in the heartland. <laughs> in 2015, Georgia Governor Nathan Deal signed Haley's Hope Act into law legalizing use of cannabis oil that contains no more than 5% THC, but due to issues with money and lawsuits, the more than 22,500 people in Georgia's low THC oil registry are still waiting for the medication they're legally approved to receive. Earlier this year, the U.S. House passed proposals to legalize marijuana nationwide. Should that proposal pass in the Senate, what effect, if any, would this change have on Georgia law? And would Georgia's 2015 law become moot? And would Georgia still be permitted to criminalize marijuana for non-medical purposes? <laughs> uh, he looked at me. All right. I, um, so uh, this has been a very interesting issue as a state legislator. There are many times issues we have to take up at the, at the Gold Dome because Congress, frankly, has not been able to take action on certain issues. And I would definitely classify this as one of them. So with Haley Hope Act, we took a proactive step to give kids and those suffering uh, the medicine that they need, and I was very proud of the effort that the state did with a virtually uh, unanimous vote, very much bipartisan support. We have now passed a cultivation bill to allow cultivation under strict guidelines, and that process is currently being rolled out by the administration with very uh, specific benchmarks that are in place. But the announcements that have been made nationally, I think, are very helpful. Ultimately, when you have a Schedule One controlled substance, according to the federal government, it becomes very problematic and difficult to implement certain aspects of that program, right? And that can uh, impact all different uh, facets. It, you know, I can't even think of right now. And so, that uh, that consideration, I think, has to be given. I do anticipate that we are going to have a national uh, bill pass in the next five years. The groundswell of support is so great, I think that it's coming. Uh, I think as, as ACLU, we certainly see that there's always been a racial disparity in how um, marijuana use has been enforced um, and, and monitored. Obviously, there's tremendous um, basis for uh, medical use of marijuana for all kinds of conditions. We had a client who was a a veteran uh, who was able to get off opioids by using marijuana, uh, but had to leave the state because he was being prosecuted in his local community. So this is clearly an issue that I think decriminalization uh, is an important uh, thing to consider. I think there are certainly, um, and I think there's a lot more the state of Georgia can do to make it possible for people who are legally able to use uh, medical marijuana but not practically able to actually get it. 
um, and, and families are with children with epilepsy are, are still having to leave the state, for example, because they can't acquire the treatment that the law says that they can get. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done. There was legislation that I think failed this year that was gonna try to make it more uh, possible for people to actually uh, uh, actually possess, uh, get, uh, acquire the marijuana that they're legally, maybe legally be allowed to use for medical purposes. This is an area where state policy of Georgia and a lot of other states is ahead of federal policy and it creates problems for a lot of people who believe you're supposed to follow the law. Um, one, one of the rules um, that Georgia lawyers have, for example, is you're not allowed to counsel your clients about how to violate the law. Um, and so the State Bar of Georgia actually submitted a proposal to my former court last year, and some other states have done this, to carve out laws where the, the, local, the state government makes something legal that may not be legal elsewhere. And my former court rejected that. And we said, you know, lawyers can't pick and choose and say, you know, we'll, follow, we'll tell our clients how to follow local law even though it still may be a federal felony to do it. Um, and, you know, our state, unfortunately, has a history of sometimes saying that our laws should supplant what federal laws are in areas that many of us think, you know, are a very bad history for our state. And so you need to think about some of these things in that light. We're not always right at the state level, but it really is something where the federal government, again, is probably behind what most Americans want and, and is having tr hard a hard time getting things through to reconcile federal policy with an emerging state policy. But it creates real problems, not only for lawyers, but also for businessmen. If you look at states where marijuana has been legalized or decriminalized and you're a banker and you're trying to you know, deal with a client who deals in what is a legal local business, but federal regulations require you um, to have protections and limitations on clients who may be engaged in in laundering money from an a federally illegal drug business. Um, and so it, this is, again, a place where our politics are not aligning very well with, um, I think, what most people's views of policy should be. So those are all good fun issues, and I've saved the two best for last <laughs> because it's Thanksgiving, and we've got to sit around with the family, and what better to talk about than things like uh, constitutional carry. Um, Governor... Governor Kemp signed uh, the law into effect in the Georgia Constitutional Carry Act held that, or the General Assembly found that it determines that the Second Amendment to the United States recognizes the right to the persons to keep and bear arms and that, shall, and that right shall not be infringed. The ACLU's position uh, is that given that the reference to a well-regulated militia and the security of a free state and the Second Amendment protects the collective right rather than the individual right, do we expect future debate on whether the Second Amendment applies to individuals, or do you think this interpretation has been widely accepted by this point? We'll lead off with Andrew. Well, um, you know, this is one of the interesting things we have with the Supreme Court and originalism. I mean, the plain language is, uh, relates to a militia, but the Supreme Court has uh, said differently. We, I do think this is not settled because, of course, the carnage continues. Uh, from uh, the impact of easy access to particularly assault weapons um, in, our, uh, in our country. Um, and also the ACLU's interest is around, you know, the impact on civil liberties and public discourse. Um, I mean, I have attended um, uh, rallies at the Capitol where people were standing around with uh, assault weapons, you know, publicly carrying assault weapons. Um, we feel that this has a, uh, a dampening impact on uh, public discourse, on the ability to air, uh, air issues in the public square, uh, and, uh, which is critical to our democracy. So we think in addition to, you know, the, in addition to the, the constitutional, th that there is the balancing test, which I think we've not talked very much about, of the impact that it has uh, on discourse in the public square. And, um, and we've seen this, you know, we've seen this in a number of um, 
the, you know, the issues are the times when we've had Black Ma Lives Matter protests. Um, there, there's now a black militia in Georgia that will stand and you know be ready when they're sort of on the pro side of Black Lives Matter, and then of course, you know, other folks are against. So I think when we're trying to debate and have uh, public discourse in the public square around very contentious issues, not not I mean, having to worry about people who you know, have weapons in the crowd, I think is uh, detrimental uh, to our uh, civil discourse. Well, I think one of the benefits of being, is this one? one of the benefits of being at the state capitol, sorry about that, you get to hear a, a real productive discussion about very important issues. I'm a former felony prosecutor in Gwinnett County, sent people to prison for very serious charges with firearms, but I'm also familiar with the facts, fact that Georgians, many Georgians want to be able to protect themselves, protect their families, and uh, need to have the ability to do that. And that oftentimes law-abiding uh, law citizens are following the law, but folks who are violating the law are not, uh, are not uh, you know, criminals, are not law-abiding. And so um, ultimately, I think that the discussion and debate around this issue certainly pose constitutional carry right now. And I know we're so close to the election, so, you know, being an elected official, that's where my mind always goes. Voters keep wanting to go back to those issues of what are you going to do to address inflation? What are you going to do to address the economy? Why is it that uh, the, we're headed into a recession and what's the plan nationally to address, what's the plan in Georgia to address that? So I think that that, uh, that that conversation is the one that voters are primarily focused on right now, and that's certainly what I'm hearing in my legislative district. So this is another one where I think the Constitution is different than policy. So the, the question was you know, this debate about the Second Amendment and you know the right to a well-regulated militia and whether that limits it. Um, I think I think the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, got that right histor as a matter of history, but it really doesn't matter in Georgia because we don't only have this little U.S. Constitution, we've got slightly larger Georgia Constitution, and the Georgia Constitution also provides a right to keep and bear arms. It says nothing about militias. It doesn't have that language, partly because the Georgia Supreme Court in 1846, the second year of our existence, explained that the right to keep and bear arms was a historical right to protect against tyranny and to provide for self-defense, protected by natural law, protected by the common law, and enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. So in 1846, the Georgia Supreme Court said, you know, militias don't, aren't the source of it. But as a matter of Georgia law, even if the U.S. Constitution doesn't matter, if you pass a law in Georgia that is limited to militia, that would be fairly clearly violative of the Georgia Constitution. But the Georgia Constitution also says the General Assembly can regulate um, how arms are born. And the case in 1846 ended up saying the General Assembly could have a law that only open carry, you can conceal weapons when you were transporting them, was a valid law, but, but prohibiting that would not be valid. So there's a lot of room, I think, again, as a matter of policy more than constitutional law. I will say as a former prosecutor, a lot of the proposals and the stuff with constitutional carry <clears throat> may affect how we feel about guns and we don't like people carrying AK-47s at rallies outside the Capitol maybe, but in terms of actually getting guns off the street, there are a lot of laws already on the books that are under enforced, particularly by federal prosecutors, of which I was one, um, that you know, you could easily prosecute people. You have to go in when you're buying a gun from a federally licensed dealer and fill out a form that is regularly used by felons. They get their girlfriends, their moms, their friends to go in and buy guns. Um, that's called straw buying. It, does, it is very rarely prosecuted even when it's discovered. Um, people go in under the Brady Bill and fill out these forms and regularly get checked and it turns out that they have a felony conviction they are almost never prosecuted, even though that's a federal felony. So there are a whole bunch of things that are on the books that could be prosecuted and probably would be more effective of getting guns out of the hands of bad guys um, than passing laws that, you know, for the most part, people who could get a concealed carry license in Georgia, there are very few cases of people who have valid concealed carry licenses committing serious crimes. There are a whole lot of cases with people who weren't gonna get a license anyway committing crimes. So again, there's a lot of room for policy that 
you know, people put these constitutional glosses on and say you either can't prohibit it or you have to prohibit it. Um, and the real answer is with um, friends like Chuck and, um, and others under the Gold Dome who you need to persuade to pass the kinds of laws um, that you think are right for the state of Georgia. And so some two previous slides I skipped over I think are interesting for you to know about is who's ineligible to carry. And as you can see, uh, the list of who is ineligible there. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, where can the lawful carriers carry? And you can see that they're prohibited uh, with the group down the right side and allowed on the left side. Um, I see that they're prohibited from the Capitol. I don't understand that, Chuck. But we'll, uh, we'll move on to where they're allowed. Um, and where they're allowed, one of the places uh, that they're allowed are in parks, historical sites, and recreational areas, which, um, well, actually, I'm going to get to that one in just a minute. Um, so skipping back to Uvalde, um, we, uh, two months, I mean, uh, in, uh, let's see. The, uh, Two months after the governor signed the Constitutional Carry Act, the tragic school shooting in Uvalde occurred. Do you expect the legislature to introduce more restrictive legislation in its wake? Well, I have not heard a uh, proposal for additional legislation in this area. I think that um, what's important to understand is we right now have a system in place that allows for uh, allows for Georgians to carry when necessary to protect themselves, to protect their families, and allows for them to have firearms, of course, uh, with, within their homes to protect in the event uh, that that's needed. But uh, what I think is maybe missed in a lot of this is that criminals who are deciding to violate the law and uh, want to get guns, they don't care what the law on carrying is in Georgia. They don't care if they have their carry permit. And, um, and I think that too often we, uh, we miss that fact. Uh, school safety is something that we take incredibly seriously. We appropriated $69 million for additional school security. It's something I was meeting with a, with a school board met last week uh, to discuss. I know that uh, this continues to be a top priority for legislators to make sure that local school districts have the resources that they need to keep students safe and that we can ensure that the bad guys are stopped when, uh, when when, uh, when they have guns. And I think that, uh, that that focus is where we need to focus. Folks who are um, uh, evil and have evil intent um, are going to, to uh, try to perpetrate those crimes irrespective of, uh, of the means. Well, I, I think there, there is a big question, though, about why people need to have and possess assault, military assault weapons. And the movie Emmett Till is out. Um, I think we, I think it's too much to ask for the parents of some of these children, um, but the impact of a military assault weapon on a fourth grader, uh, I think if, if people really had to confront that, we would see different public policy. You know, that's my, my, my grandfather and my mother grew up hunting. They ate what they shot. You know, but this idea that, you know, of recre military assault weapons for Recreational purposes, I think, is very dangerous, um, and you know we had the death toll to prove it. So again, this is one where you know mass shootings are kind of front of mind because of the the recognition they get, and they're in the headlines. Um, most of the proposals that are submitted will do very little to stop mass shootings. Mass shootings would really be stopped, I think, much better by laws about uh, mental health treatment, red flagging, and, and other things that could spot people um, who may commit crimes like that. The Uvalde shooter, I went back and checked, you know, he bought his guns legally, um, and by all accounts, he would have been eligible for a weapons carry permit um, in Texas. Now, in Georgia, he was 18. He would have had to be, I think, 21 to get a handgun, but he bought long guns, and you have to be 18 in Georgia, I think, for long guns. Um, what a lot of these laws really do, and where the vast, vast amount of gun violence happens is not in mass shootings, but it's in the, the 15 shootings every weekend in the city of Atlanta and in most of your communities. Um, and, and there, some of these laws can have effect, and more importantly, the, the enforcement of existing laws. Um, but, you know, assault weapons, 
my court, my former court, rarely used that term because there really is nothing, you know, an assault weapon is not really a defined term. Um, it was created in the 90s. They made a list of assault weapons for a federal ban on assault weapons that was kind of concocted to, to ban certain kinds of guns, and you could swap out the metal, um, you know, the metal uh, stock of it for a wooden stock, and suddenly it wasn't an assault rifle anymore, even though it was functionally identical. Um, you know, the question is, what kinds of guns do we want to allow within the limits of, of the Second Amendment and the, and the Georgia Constitution? But really, much more of the focus, we always focus on these mass shootings, maybe because it gets people ginned up to go get legislation, but, but where people are dying in droves are the everyday shootings that happen, and they're single shootings, or two or three people, and they're almost always done with handguns, um, and, and that's the area that is hard to draw attention to, but is much more important if we're going to try to reduce gun violence. And I'd mentioned one of the places that they were allowed are parks. Um, Music Midtown, as you know, was canceled as a result of the legislation that allows people to carry in the parks, causing a $50 million loss to the economy. Um, a question I had about that, I think, has been answered in the questions that in the answers that y'all just given, so I'm going to skip on to that, but that's certainly something uh, to note and to think about. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health Organizations, the abortion and the um, heartbeat bill here in Georgia. Um, what uh, consequences, if any, do you anticipate regarding the standard of care for women's health as a result of the law changing the unfettered availability of abortion from 20 weeks to six weeks? Um, well, this is actually an issue that's being litigated in state court uh, right now. Um, there is a, you know, it's important to note that Georgia had a statute that was uh, pre-viability um, and that um, the, the current law now is a six-week abortion ban before most people know that they are pregnant. Um, and act and we, we as ACLU did a survey of um, what Georgians think about the right to privacy as it, as it relates to your body and found that 87% of Georgians polled believe that there is a right to privacy um, when, uh, when it comes to your body. We are now challenging um, this law under the Georgia Constitution um, and we think there is some very strong policy um, around the right to privacy um, in the Georgia, in the Georgia Constitution, the the I think the impact on this I think many people when they think about this question of you know elective uh, elective abortion um, think of sort of the mythical uh, welfare queen who's using abortion as birth control, um, and not thinking about the impact on uh, women you know. Uh, in having a miscarriage, a uh, student at UGA, um, women with underlying conditions that are exacerbated by a pregnancy, um, but not to the point of you know, necessarily ending their life, but certainly damaging their health in a permanent way. Um, and so these are very complex matters, which is why up until, you know, for the last 50 years, they have been decisions made by a physician, um, uh, the, a woman, her, her family, her spouse, and the physician, uh, because these are very uh, personal decisions. Uh, and up until recently, you know, the, the, the Constitution, the constitutional law was that uh, people have the right to make their own decisions about when, whether, and with whom uh, to have or expand a family. We're now in very different territory uh, we have 50 years of uh, protocol, medical protocols, practices, interventions that have all grown up while, um, while people had the right to make these personal decisions. You know, 50 years ago, there wasn't a treatment for breast cancer. Um, now there is. You know, there are so many, so many situations where, you know, 50 years ago was not really an issue because there was no treatment uh, if a woman was pregnant and, and found that she had breast cancer. There now is, um, and so we have these. We have now taken where the government, the district attorney, 
is now intervening and making decisions that should be and have been the private, um, private uh, zone of decision making for the pregnant woman, her own physician, her own faith, her own family. I'll just, just to be clear, um, for the last 50 years, it hasn't been entirely a private decision. Under Roe v. Wade, um, the state could completely ban abortion in, in the final trimester, and the state's passed a whole bunch of laws in that area. Under Casey, which supposedly reaffirmed Roe v. Wade, it was changed from the, the end of the second trimester to viability. Um, on the grounds of stare decisis, keeping the law will change the law to make it viability. And, and now that's been eliminated on the federal side, so it's up to the policymakers to make the decision. Um, and I'm, this is a particular, I won't predict what will happen um, on the state side because there is a state constitution that uh, now people are paying attention to in this area, and that is being litigated now. But, um, but one thing to realize, and, and it goes to kind of complaints about the U.S. Supreme Court and legitimacy is, this is one of the rare things where the U.S. Supreme Court, when a court says something is a constitutional right, um, particularly something that's not laid out in the Constitution, like the right to keep and bear arms, the court is basically saying, like, we are now the rule makers. We're going to set policy. So in Roe v. Wade, the court said there's a right, and we're going to set the line at the second trimester. And then there were at least, you know, two or three cases of the U.S. Supreme Court every year and dozens and dozens of cases in other federal courts about what is the second trimester? Can you have parental consent laws? Can you have bypasses? Then the court said, no, not second trimester. Now we're going to do undue burden and viability. And there were every year cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, where is viability? Can you have bypass? Can you do other things? Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said, we're out of the line drawing business. Now, I don't know whether my old court will get into the line drawing business, but you know, normally we draw lines in our legislatures, and you know, if if people don't like the sick, the issue in Dobbs was the Mississippi statute that said abortions are largely banned after 15 weeks. Most Western European countries ban abortions after 12 weeks. Germany, France, um, a legislature can decide. Well, you know, 15 weeks is too much. 12 weeks is right. Six weeks is right, six weeks is too little. You know, that's all flexible. When a court does it, the only way you get from 15 weeks to 12 weeks is to overrule your precedent in a violation of stare decisis. The only way you get from six weeks to 12 weeks is to overrule your precedent and say we were wrong. And so, you know, I, I think that's a lot of what was underlying the U.S. Supreme Court is the discomfort of every year being challenged and saying, well, is 15 weeks the right amount? We used to say viability. If they said 15 weeks was, was okay, then you were going to get 12 weeks and six weeks. Um, and I think they threw up their hands and said, let's let the people who get elected make those decisions. Now, you may or may not like that, but it is actually a rare area where the U.S. Supreme Court has said, we're going to do less in the world rather than take ownership and run the world. Well, the, as was said, there's ongoing litigation about this today um, in Atlanta. What I, what I would just say is this, uh, as has been outlined, uh, additional protections, including for unborn children, are allowed by the legislature. I mean, that, uh, the question is what protections are appropriate is, is, the, is the discussion. And I, I think that it's important to highlight, it was uh, talked a moment ago about um, pregnant mothers and health care. Um, the st state legislature has extended um, uh, Medicaid coverage for pregnant moms and even at post-birth. Uh, and initially, this really came about because examining the maternal mortality issue, the question around the data uh, there that was involved. But I'm very proud of the work that the General Assembly has done to expand Medi Medicaid coverage for moms who are expecting and, um, and then after birth. Uh, because, of course, uh, challenges post-birth continue for, uh, for, for moms, and that Medicaid coverage is very important. Yeah, and we certainly, and we certainly support that. Our position is that these should be decisions of, you know, of women and families, uh, and that absolutely the, uh, the state should be providing more support uh, for uh, women and their young children um, uh, in health care and education and early uh, early childhood uh, education. 
Um, one of the other things as, you know, as a business community is thinking about how this impacts Georgia's competition for uh, talent. So Georgia's economy, uh, I believe, is built on transportation and tolerance. You know, we were the city too busy to hate. We were the city that did not, uh, you know, that, did, that, that was willing to, to be involved in settlements around uh, segregation, racial segregation, which was the law of the land when, when I came to Atlanta. So I think when we're, you're looking at now 50% um, of the population between, you know, what, 16 and 40 are now essentially second-class citizens. They don't have the full right to make decisions about, um, about their lives. Uh, and I think women, in thinking about, are they coming to Atlanta um, for, for jobs? Are they coming to Atlanta for schools? Uh, for schools? Uh, are going to have to, are, are going to be thinking about that. Um, and I think it's not, you know, it's sort of brand, you know, as I think of brand Atlanta is a place that's inclusive, that's tolerant, that's diverse, you know, we, we um, and this is something that means a great deal um, to a lot of people that they get to make these choices for themselves. And um, just, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and just as mm -hmm. Governor Roy Cooper tried to take advantage of the, the uh, closing of the Music Midtown so as to, to amplify what Andrew just talked about. The governor of New Jersey put up uh, board, billboards here to try to lure businesses to New Jersey and so did Governor Gavin Newsom from California try to lure the uh, Hollywood industry to quit making movies here which has been a very good uh, source of income to uh, stay in California. I wanted to uh, just throw those up there. I had one more issue on um, whether the uh, AG's role on abortion is, but we're running out of time, and I really do want to open up five minutes for questions, so I'm going to ask President Blank to come back up, and, um, and as she's walking up here, uh, throughout the one last issue about does personhood uh, have any effect on, you had touched on the economics of, of, a, of a child. Uh, the Georgia Department of Revenue has indicated that a child becomes a person at um, viability, so, and, the, and they're allowing them to become a tax deduction. What about other things like, can they travel in the HOV lane and, and things like that? <laughs> well, this, this legislation allows uh, child support to be ordered uh, while a mother's pregnant, and so um, I, I don't know that you mentioned that example in addition to the, uh, to the tax credit. So uh, I think the consistency is there. And of course, all of that could be done on behalf of the pregnant woman. Um, and so the policies, there's nothing wrong. I mean, those policies are, are great. And I wish when I were pregnant that that had been the rule. But uh, I th I, and I think I can safely say up here, I'm the only person up here who's given birth. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so I think pregnant women are due all kinds of support, right? And it's not necessarily to then take away their rights to self-determination in order to provide that kind of support. So we are going to open it up to a few questions. But one that I did have because of um, the six weeks, um, if, if someone is in an accident or creates bodily harm to a pregnant woman that causes her to miscarry, under the new law, would you then be charged with vehicular homicide? Um, what, what are the, what, and uh, David, you're smiling at that one. What, are the, what would the law then say for a prosecutor? Um, would, is that something you could be charged with? I mean, I think these are many things that uh, were not necessarily in the mind of legislators when they were dealing with this act. They were thinking about things like trying to get a law that would potentially survive or get challenged under Casey and Roe and, and things like child support and the kind of natural things that flow from um, getting pregnant and having a child. But, um, you know, th there's a law against homicide um, and vehicular homicide. There's now this law, and it uses the word person, like almost all our criminal laws do. There's now a law defining persons to include children past approximately six weeks. So that's something the courts would have to sort out. And it really, you know, for the kind of court I left, it really doesn't matter what the legislature was hoping would be the answer or intended to be the answer. It, it 
depends on what they wrote down on paper and passed as law and the governor signed into law. And so there may be some consequences of things that were not intended. Now in the in the in a good world, legislatures learn as they they see these things happening and they adjust laws, but in areas like this, it's so hard to potentially adjust laws that you may end up seeing some unpleasant, unintended consequences from the fact that it's hard to adjust a law that if you reopen the law, puts everything back on the table. There was a question over here. I'm, I'm not familiar with what you're referring to. What I mean, what happens in Georgia is you, um, people in, in 2020 were sent applications for a ballot. So you had to send in an application to the, the county or the Secretary of State's office, the, that, and then they would send you the ballot. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the only instances in terms of you know, sort of people getting a mass uh, piece of, would, would have been the application, certainly not the ballot. Um, we, it is public record when, whether or not you can go online to see whether um, you've, your ballot request has been received. You can go online to see whether your ballot request has been mailed back. Um, you know, Georgia has very good documentation for all the stages of this process, which, you know, again, we saw in 2020. So the, that the, um, but the, two, the recounts, the audits, and so forth, you know, um, were, you know, found that the result that was reported was the result, you know, after multiple recounts. The, uh, the other thing I will say about the drop boxes is that they were, um, they were in public, they were in libraries with cameras on them 24 seven. So there were no unattended drop boxes in, in, in Georgia. And I personally used the one right over here on Auburn Avenue in front of the Auburn Avenue Library, um, which, and you know, I think that, that so it, you know, it, is, it does become this question of policy. Is it your policy to make sure that every Georgian who is a citizen who wants to vote has a fair opportunity to cast a ballot. Um, and that's what we work toward, is that every Georgian um, that's a citizen, you know, has, has that opportunity. Um, and 2020 was a time when that policy worked very, very well. And so, but it was changed subsequently to be more, to be more difficult and to be more challenging, despite the absence of any evidence that people were cheating. We've got another question over here for Bruce. Anybody want to take that one on, Chuck? These, these issues are being debated right now at the state capitol. So this, uh, the, the issues that you brought up, we see legislation each year to discuss and debate these issues. Just the availability of housing in general as well is really a, a discussion that's 
I'm participating in a study committee on right now. So uh, I very much appreciate the question. I don't have any uh, specific answers for you at the moment, just that there is legislation being introduced consistently now to debate these issues and, uh, and to determine the best approach, particularly as we uh, came out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you and I uh, were just talking about some things that could be done around the homeless problem in Georgia. So um, you think when, when Georgia can make good policy, when we take the time and get all the stakeholders at the table, we've, we've, we've done that in the criminal justice reform arena, and hopefully we can do that on some of these issues around um, making sure our, our, our friends and neighbors have a place to live. So if we look at the um, constitutional concealed carry, do private businesses have the right to restrict um, an individual from entering with um, a handgun? We are a private club. Um, what, what, where does the rule meet your right so, as a citizen versus your right as a business and, or private entity? So you do, under a decision of, of my former court that this part of the law goes back to 2014, and it's not actually part of this constitutional carry. You have a right if you're a private person who has an estate in your property. So if you own your home, you own your business, or you have a lease um, on your business. But if you have what's called a usufruct, which is a weird Georgia thing, the only Georgia and Louisiana have it, which is um, a short-term lease that doesn't give you normal property owner rights, then you don't have the right, um, if, if your property was public to start with. Now, if, if you're a private person who leases from another private person, it basically gives your landlord the right to decide gun policy. But in general, and unless you are on public property and you only have a use of rock, which is the problem at Piedmont Park, which is public property, and the botanical garden was determined to only have a use of rock, and I think Midtown, um, Music Midtown was, you know, a short-term thing, so it didn't have its own property rights. The General Assembly has said generally public property in Georgia, you have a right, uh, people have a right to carry their guns. So my question to you, Chuck, would be how is that decision made then? Which public places are exempt from that, like the Capitol, and which public places are not? Well, uh, great question. As was just said, this predates the constitutional carry legislation. So this has been, this legislation has been in effect for I think eight years at this point. Um, really the debate around uh, churches, restaurants, things like that, that debate and discussion takes place with policymakers. And as often happens at the state capitol, compelling arguments can be made on both sides of the issue. What we try to do is really balance the uh, important considerations that we have, including public safety and ensuring that, um, that uh, you know, the cap state capital was mentioned earlier. We're sure government buildings that have a security checkpoint are excluded. That's not uh, included in the list. So a careful review is made of each classification of business for these determinations. Any other questions? I know we are running over today, but that is no surprise given all we threw at you. Yes, Chuck. Just a, just a quick one. Um, with SB 202, is there sort of a root cause analysis facts that say the new legislation should attack these things that led to potential fraud or inaccuracies in voting, and therefore we'll measure it, and it should demonstrate that Well, thank you for the question. So Senate Bill 202 was really a comprehensive bill that dealt with many different aspects of election law. And so it was mentioned, I'm trying to not uh, cover some of the stuff we've already hit too much, but it was mentioned drop boxes. Drop boxes did not exist, to my knowledge, prior to the pandemic. And they were put in place during the pandemic without regulation in state law. The state elections board approved it. And so, um, and Contrary to what was said earlier, I am familiar with drop boxes that were not attended uh, and that were open for access 24 hours a day. And, um, and, I, and part of the uh, 
part of Senate Bill 202 was to provide consistency in certain requirements for oversight of that, like the drop box is available when the precinct is open, has to be inside the precinct, and restrictions like that. As was mentioned, the absentee ballot request forms that caused real confusion. So many of these forms were sent out in the 2020 election, as I understand it, with even with information populated into the form. And it caused confusion from voters receiving the, these who may not be up on the election law like folks in this room are, but out, you know, but received that and, and thought it was a ballot or thought maybe, why am I receiving this? I've already requested a ballot, questions along those lines. And so Senate Bill 202, and there are many components to it, of course, but it addressed those very specific concerns that were raised from the 2020 election and, um, and provided consistency. And the metric to judge how it's doing, I would say, is turnout. Turnout in a midterm right now is incredibly high. It's as high as presidential elections, um, despite the fact this is November in an uh, off year from the presidential election. Right. But so, they couldn't use a metric of uh, whether it reduced cheating because there was no cheating baseline to measure it against. The, good, the one good thing we did get into the bill is that there are now two mandatory Saturdays uh, for voting uh, in every county uh, in the state of Georgia. And so that, is, that was a good, uh, comp uh, good thing that we were able to, uh, to get out of that to expand access to the ballot. Helene, I know you had a question in the back. It'll be our last one. Well, of course, I have to say the ACLU of Georgia website. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on the back of this card that all of you all uh, have. Uh, and then, of course, you know, our, I mean, our, our paper of record, the AJC, does very, uh, you know, has an excellent voter guide that we also cite uh, in some of our, our materials. And the Secretary of State's website. You know, the Secretary of State, um, you know, has done an excellent job in terms of modernizing uh, access to a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of this information. And we work, you know, very closely with the Secretary of State's office on, you know, things like poll workers. I know Coca-Cola is, you know, given their employees leave to be able to participate in being poll workers in our democracy. There's been a lot of support from the business community in helping to make our elections, you know, run smoothly. You know, Phillips Arena opened up. And so I think there's a good civic spirit and that when people participate in the process and they know, they know the people who are running it, that these are your friends and neighbors, you know, we can all be more confident in the result. And we want people to understand that this is a competitive process. And if everyone has a fair chance to compete, you accept the winner. Um, that's how democracy works and that's what we fight for. And David and Chuck, do you have any websites that you would recommend that show kind of all of the effects of potential laws so that everybody can kind of mull these over and come to their own conclusions? Well, I, what a terrific question. I actually, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I really rely on the Atlanta media. I think Atlanta media does a great job of covering the issues that are of real importance and are, are being debated at the Capitol. And the General Assembly's website, legis.ga.gov, is an incredible way to look up legislation, actually read it, see it there on the page, and be able to um, evaluate who's sponsoring it, if there's uh, bipartisan co-sponsorship. And, um, and so during the legislative session, second Monday in January till the end of March typically, I, th I would really recommend looking at the uh, Georgia General Assembly website and watching committee meetings, uh, watching session. So I think the AJC legislation tracker and the General Assembly are good but they have everything, and, and there's a lot of legislation that's on there that's not going to go anywhere. Um, if there's a group that you, you know, that is involved in the kinds of issues you're really interested in, the ACLU, you know, children's issues, gun issues, the, the interest groups tend now to have very good um, legislation tracking and info on their websites. And so you can, you know, put into Google Georgia gun rights, and you'll get... Uh, you know, a group that'll give you that side of it. You can put in the ACLU, but that's a good way to figure out what's going on and get involved, um, particularly in the kinds of issues you may be most interested in. And, and then once you figure out what you're involved with, you know, I'm always amazed by how open our legislators at the state and local level are to you calling them up and 
saying you have a view or sending them an email, um, compared to you know the feds, um, they are right there and they represent you and they are interested in representing you. And I was amazed by our court had an enormous amount of, of interaction with them um, and they were always willing to take calls and talk to you about issues. And I would also say NPR and the AJC both have very good podcasts, Political Rewind and Political, um, I forget what the AJC calls it. Um, breakfast. Yeah, yeah, Political Breakfast. No, break, no break Political out, break. Breakfast is Yeah, so the AJC both have great podcasts on politics. And Jennifer, do you have something up on your site that shows... Okay. All right. Well, please, those of you diehards that stuck around, please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you all very much.